Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're uh, with a great joy again. We come together to study uh, Revelation. Um, how exciting it is to know that uh, John had within his heart for uh, you to come quickly. Lord, may that be our desire as well. As we Amen. go through life with all the things that are around us, all the things that bother us, um, always the Lord help us to keep our eyes heavenly because it is from there that we will find our deliverance so indeed Lord come quickly bless Charlie tonight as he presents us to, to us may your spirit dwell with us in this study uh, may each one of us find something that we need to encourage us along the way I ask this in Jesus name amen amen uh, well, tonight we're on our last chapter of the book of Revelation, and uh, it starts off, we get to see a little view over the horizon again. Uh, we get to look and see a little bit more about what John was talking about last week with the new Jerusalem and the river that flows from the throne of God and the tree of life. And uh, we're also getting both a, a warning and an invitation. Uh, it's going to be a little sad to have completed the book of Revelation, but uh, I think we have some, some good op options coming up, so I look forward to talking with you at the end with that. Uh, this is uh, the overview we've sort of been using to say where we are with the last part of the book of Revelation. Uh, again, we saw the gospel era a few times with the sevens, and we saw the God's wrath and the last warning, the seven last plagues. Uh, we started in 19 with the return of Jesus, 20 with a thousand years and the two resurrections, 21 all things new, and the new Jerusalem tonight. We're going, we're going to see the tree of life, the river of life, and Jesus is, I guess, final, final invitation, as it were. Uh, in 22, uh, uh, we'll go and see some more remarkable things, but what's even better is that we are not hearing directly from just the angel anymore, but Jesus addresses us directly. This is my sort of summary. Uh, chapter 222 begins as we can as a continuation of 21. So John described this beautiful city. Uh, I sort of think when we listened to that last week, it is so pretty, it's hard to it's hard to put into words. And so he used a lot of uh, precious gems to describe the beauty of uh, New Jerusalem. Uh, whether the, uh, whether it's exactly like that with those gems or just the coloration he's trying to capture, I'm not sure, but what a beautiful place that God has put together for us. And he continues that when he, when he talks about the, uh, the water of life coming out of the throne. Uh, Jesus himself speaks and he offers again for us to come unto him. Uh, there is an emphasis at the very end on, on the book of Revelation, that it is open. And it is especially, I think, as the time of the end grows near. And Jesus is anxious to know that he is ready to return. When everything is done, he's ready. And uh, his reward is with him. Uh, if I break this down to the seven steps in Revelation, I should say 22, by the way. How did I let that get by? But anyway, 22. Uh, the river and the tree of life, we see that. Uh, we Are these words true? We get an answer to that question because Jesus speaks, speaks directly to us. Uh, he gives us an invitation. You know, we see the invitation over and over again. Early on, we see, I stand at the door and knock. And yet here he says, come again. How seriously should those words be taken? We're given a little view of that. And... John is impassioned with the desire for Jesus to come. And until that time, uh, we have Jesus' grace. So let's start with Revelation 22, 1 and 2. Uh, it says in, in verse 1 here, it says, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street, and on either side of the river, was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, 
each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Now, in Revelation 2, 1 through 5, we're going to see that we, continuing the description that John is trying to give us from the New Jerusalem and what he's seen from 21, uh, it begins with this crystal clear, pure water, uh, water of life that fills the river that flows from the throne of God. Now, when you hear water of life, who comes to mind? Jesus. Jesus. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Jesus. I, I immediately go to that interaction he had with the woman at the well and uh, said, if you knew who was talking to you, <laughs> you know, this water is going to spring forth in living water. So you think of Jesus and in a way, this is very much, this river is very symbolic of Jesus and that whatever he touches, it seems to bring life. And that's was we found that in Ezekiel 47, everything will live wherever the river goes. And if, if we let it, Jesus coming to us, touching us, gives us life. Uh, in verse 7 of Revelation 2, we see something important about the tree of life. You and uh, something about the water there. I, I, would, I would enjoy that. <laughs> One thing about water, um, you know, you do thirst and you need water. If you got plenty of water, it's satisfying, isn't it? Yep. It brings life to you. It's refreshing. And uh, that's a good symbol for Christ in that sense. He's, Christ satisfies the need in your life, the hunger in your life. Um, and it's also refreshing to be able to to go to christ so i've always liked that term of jesus calling himself the water of life it's um and you have to have water to, to live <laughs> and, and there's uh, nothing okay. as good as a glass of water yeah a good cold glass of water yes. so i've always viewed jesus in those terms um and that he satisfies the thirst that we all have um uh, on a spiritual level. Yes, I think we could we could spend a long time here thinking about why this image is given. You know, why why this river flowing from the from the throne of God is so important. But it is important because of what you're saying. You know, it to everyone who thirsts, remember the blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Oh. You know, so there's there is the filling here is being filled with Jesus Christ. If we have that hunger and thirst, we'll be filled with Jesus Christ. It's quite a promise. And so as we see this river going, it's, it's more than just refreshing in a physical sense. It's refreshing in a whole spiritual sense. A renewing uh, a righteousness becomes something that, is, that lives in us and through us. And it's part of that great, uh, that great city. That great city is, is more than just beauty in that it's a beautiful thing to look at. It's full of people who are full of love and hope and trust, and we're all working together in harmony and love. So it's a, it's a wonderful thing. So uh, it's hard. You know, when I think about that, I'm excited. Let's go now. So, you know. I think the tree of life sounds pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. It is. It is. I think that's so cool. Yeah. Uh, I'm looking forward to climbing it. I wonder if I'll be allowed to do that. I don't know. <laughs> we'll have the body to be able to then, maybe. Yeah. Oh, so, but but I know that I'll have access to it if I am what? In according to Revelation 2, 7. Overcome. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life. Uh, so this promise goes through Revelation that the... Um, being overcomers, the being overcomer means, uh, means what? To overcome the devil. All right. We overcome it's him by the, just, Larry's good at this, by the, we overcome him by the, by the blood blood of of I couldn't hear you, Larry, what? By the blood of Christ. Right, yes. Christ. By the word of the testimony of the blood of Christ, right? Uh, we overcome him by going to Jesus. And that is what gives us the right to eat from the tree of life. 
uh, on either side of the river grows this tree of life. Uh, I'm still wondering, I try to picture these, these two big root trunks coming together, uh, but uh, it, it, it's amazing to think about it. But obviously there is a, it is dependent upon this river that, that, that waters it. And it, 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 this is the first time I think we've seen it. I'm not sure, but we saw it in the Garden of Eden and it was taken away. The humans didn't have access to it anymore. Now they have access to it again. And as I think Eddie pointed out last week, this fruit that comes every month corresponds to Isaiah 66, 22 and 23. that says from one new moon to another, that's why it's monthly. And from one Sabbath to another, another all flesh will come before me. And you think about that, of all the people who are coming, who are in, in love with Jesus, who are worshiping him and praising him, it's going to be quite an amazing praise service every time, right? Yeah, you know, this uh, kind of indicates that there will be uh, time measurement in heaven. You know, if yeah. you have a month and a uh, Sabbath, right. a 24-hour period of, of seven day week uh that's uh kind of you know it's hard to I, i'll get to tell you a little story my uh father-in-law was talking about how thinking about forever just kind of freaked him out and it's interesting my daughter said the same thing when she was a little girl she said daddy thinking about forever is kind of scary <laughs> and um I really didn't know how to answer that, but uh, I told her, I said, just, it's like uh, right now, you just live one day at a time, you enjoy uh, the weekly cycle, and you, you don't think about it ending. Uh, in heaven, it'll be like that. You won't have to think about ever it ever ending for you. Um, so it's, in, it's encouraging to me to, to know there's a measurement of time. Because I'm sure sometimes when we've been there 10,000 years, you know, we're going to say, hey, today we celebrate 10,000 years and, uh, since we've been in heaven. So I don't know. Well, Just thank you well know. you know, I look at the other verses we've talked about. Now we're going a little off, off uh, the course here. But, you know, mm -hmm. we talk about the people building houses, planting vineyards, you know, uh, reaping the fruits of their labor. And heaven is about accomplishment too. It's not something where we sit around just singing and worshiping. We also accomplish things. And, but the accomplishment is all to the glory of God too. So our accomplishment is worship as well. But it is not going to be something where we're just sitting around on clouds. We're doing something, right? Yeah. So I, I think that's, that's what's going to make it really amazing. Uh, so uh, that uh, we can take on tasks that we never would have thought we could have before. Uh, and who knows where we'll be taking them on, all of them, but uh, exciting. Yeah. yeah. But here's the more ex most exciting verse here, I think. Uh, in verse 3, it says, And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. There need no there need no lamp or light of the sun. No, they need, me. they need no light, lamp or light of the sun for the Lord God gives them light and they shall reign forever and ever. Uh, the curse, the curse which uh, put a blight on this whole creation and touched everything on this earth. You know, we, we see that in Isaiah. Uh, therefore the curse has devoured the earth. And, uh, and all the dwellers left it, left it desolate. Uh, therefore, the inhabitants of the earth are burned. Uh, the, the second Peter uh, 3 passages which talks about the need to recreate by melting all, all the elements. Uh, tells us that the blight touched everything. And then the human beings, we know that we are corruptible today, but Jesus promises in 1 Corinthians, 15, a twinkling of eye change to become incorruptible. And so the curse of sin and death, they're saying here, it's gone. It's over. Uh, the law of God is perfectly written on our hearts. Uh, with love, we all work in harmony with each other and with God. 
and all of his creation. And one of the evidences that the curse is gone is this. Those who are in Christ have been changed, no longer being corruptible. Now they can see God face to face. Isn't that amazing? I mean, that's uh, John, 1 John 3, 2 says this, for we will see him as he is. Uh, we shall see him face to face. What is What meaning does that have to you? Oh, awesome. An exciting time to meet the creator of the universe. That we will be changed so much that we would be able to stand and face him face to face and not be destroyed by his purity and his righteousness. Yes. Amen. I mean, I've had the experience one time in my life of feeling that I was so close to Jesus, I've got it closer, I would die. So I actually have an understanding of why that impurity in us doesn't stand a chance with the purity of him. But this this is this is like a, a tremendous blessing on more than one level, but one level is that we have been changed, as you're pointing out, Joy. You know, we have been changed. And the other is that we can have that uninhibited communion with our God. You know, that uh, we're not we're not stuck with, you know, having to pray through layers of atmosphere. <laughs> it's like sometimes we think we are. We have that communion directly with God. You know, and how wonderful that that will be, for sure. Uh, we, we start that now by prayer and having communion with them, but then it's going to be so much more, so much more in my mind. Uh, and as far as this passage about there no being in the sun, I, I don't know uh, if that's literal or not, because, you know, as, as Eddie, you're saying there is time, time passage, but I know that the light, there is a light that's the light of the world, and that was Jesus claimed to be. I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. And so this, in the holy city, we have Jesus, the light of the world. And I do not know how metaphorical or how physical it will be, but I know that brightness is going to be the dominating thing being in that city. Any thoughts? Well, the part that says they need no lamp nor light of the sun doesn't say there is no lamp or light of the sun. Uh, yeah. We don't need it. Yeah, just the whole place will be bright, like God. Yeah, all right. Well, we know that in, uh, in the Psalms, we're told that uh, his word is a lamp unto our feet. And now instead of a lamp, we have the brightness of the sun and <laughs> uh, all we do. So we'll be able to, the, the, uh, the spiritual awareness, the, the closeness of Jesus is just going to be something that uh, will be overwhelming, I think. But it's full of hope. That's our hope. So I, I have to I have to bring in the chasm, chiasm uh, because we are now at the very end, the epilogue, and it's interesting to note that the prologue and the epilogue share several common themes. Uh, for instance, uh, they both talk about things which must take place shortly. They both talk about Jesus coming, how faithful Jesus is. How is the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last? And there's a blessing given to those who read or keep the prophecy. So I, f I find that interesting that uh, the prologue and the epilogue repeat these common themes. And that, once again, tells us how important it is that we understand that these things are written for us because they're going to take place shortly. And Jesus is faithful. And not only did he begin things, what he starts, he ends. And, uh, and there's a blessing in this book that we've been reading. So now to verse six, does anyone want to read uh, Revelation six and seven? I'll read it. Okay. Then he said to me, these words are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Amen. Amen. 
I hope you see, you see how how similar this is to a lot of things we read in uh, in in verse in the chapter one. Yeah. But it's also also refers back to chapter nineteen because they're faithful and true, just like the rider was on the white horse, uh, Jesus coming back, faithful and true. So we we see Jesus, the second coming of Jesus, he's called faithful and true, his words are faithful and true, and these words are faithful and true. Uh, this is a, we'll see in this epilogue, we sort of see the same themes throughout the book of Revelation here. Uh, Jesus puts a certification on this by saying, that they are faithful and true words. Uh, uh, for each generation of Christian, we've seen that revelation has shown what must shortly take place for them. And in a very real sense, it is promises too of the second coming and the world made new. So Christians can see not only where they are at, they know where we're going. We all share that same vision. We share the same vision of Abraham who looked for that uh, city whose builder and maker were God. And there's an emphasis here on Jesus's quick return. And I, I, at first I found that interesting because I hold it for those in the first century, if they expected a quick return, uh, they might have said, oh, he should be here, you know, this century. Yeah, perhaps, but perhaps another way of looking at this is to understand that there were some events to take place and that's why he wrote them down and he was so decisions had to be made, so there was investigation and reward to be decided. But after all those are done, after the events are done, and after the judgments are made, decisions are made, there's no reason why for Jesus, for Jesus to slow down, to carry. He's going to come quickly. Uh, so uh, I think that we see that the, uh, throughout the opening of the seals, all those things are going to take place, but at the end, Jesus comes quickly because of the, the, his reward is with them. I think of that verse, um, I forget where it is, I think it may be Isaiah, where it says, he that shall come, will come, will not hear. Yep, he shall come, he will come, and he's coming, he's coming on time. And if we understand the words of this prophecy, there's a blessing here that says, blessing here to us. So as we've been reading it, I hope we've been blessed uh, or feeling blessed. Would someone like to read 8 and 9? I'll read it. Okay. Now I, John, saw and heard these things. And when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. Then he said to me, see that you do not do that, for I am your fellow servant of your brother and of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. Amen. You know, worship is a key theme to the book of Revelation, is it not? Yeah. So it's uh, interesting that it, it comes up again here that we make sure that we worship God. As it says in Revelation 14, worship him who made heaven, earth, and the sea, and the springs of water. Uh, we don't want to be caught up in worshiping other things and you, but you can see how john would have been overwhelmed here by what he was seeing and why he might have felt like doing that but i'm glad that the angel was quick to say no i don't want that and i think anytime anytime we see someone who wants that worship who is not god we should worry about that you know about who that person is and what they what they are yeah there's something about falling down at the feet of another person that highly uh, or falling down before an idol, for example. Right. Uh, that's uh, this. This tells me that uh, we should should not do that. Uh, the angel does, doesn't want us to do that. They're they're a, a messenger. Right. So once again, it's like yeah, all the things we see as people, yeah looking at things that are not God and falling down and worshiping them, that would be, that would be not something God would approve of and not and his angels certainly wouldn't approve of it. Worship God. And I think that's something we can take from this as a, as something that we can hold on to. Uh, and we know who the, which God to worship, right? It's the creator God, the one who created heaven and earth and seal all, all who is in them. And 
and also the lover of our souls, the one who uh, came to die for us. Yeah. I just noticed something else in where it says, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel. I have always thought of that as falling down to worship the angel, but it's perhaps maybe not that at all. Uh, John probably knew it wasn't right to worship angels. I'm sure he didn't. So he's actually worshiping God, but it was before the feet of the angel. Um, we should worship God without anything in between us. And that, uh, so I, I guess it's another way of looking at it. Well, if you take that point of view, then the angel may is, is trying to make sure that it isn't confused, that no one gets confused. Right. right. Yeah, good. Worship uh, God. Yeah. All right. And he said, certainly doesn't want to accept worship that belongs to God. So, yeah. And he said to me, do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. Now, I think this is a crucial point in this prophecy, in, in the revelation. Is it sealed or is it not sealed? Uh, not sealed. <laughs> not sealed, yeah. Well, John is told not to seal the words of the prophecy. And why? Because the time is at hand. Time right. is at hand. Yeah, yeah. It'd be, this is, to me, I'm looking at it. If he was told to seal it, it'd be like saying, here, I have this complicated thing. I'm going to hand it to you. But I'm going to take the instruction book and I'm going to seal it up and you can't see it. Right. Yeah. And you can't call customer service either. So uh, it, it just wouldn't make sense. It wouldn't make sense to seal it up because the time was at hand. Yeah, and as we've seen, we've seen through the historical point of view, indeed, every part, every time period of the Christian gospel era has had elements that are directly related to them. So there is no reason to seal it up. Eddie, you were saying something? Awful, yeah, there's an awful lot of people that says you can't under, understand Revelation. So imagine that God gives a message to John but and seals it up and then says nobody can understand this well what good is it yeah that's oh. right <laughs> right well yeah. and, and let, let's consider for a second people who try to close the book of revelation and we see them you know we see them today in fact we've talked about them one being the preterism or the preterist view which holds that all the prophecies have been fulfilled and have no meaning today and so that sort of flies in the face of this thing, the time is at hand, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and the futures, that doesn't make any I mean, sense both, that. Both the futures and the preterists are, in effect, like you say, sealing it up because they're right. saying, don't worry about it. It's either already been fulfilled or it's going to be after you're gone. So, I mean, doesn't that sound just like what Satan would want us to think? Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah because the future is, like you say, everything happens after the fourth chapter is after we're all raptured and gone, right? So it didn't, it didn't apply to us. Why would, again, would he say the time is at a hand and don't seal up the book? Uh, yeah, both of those approaches attempt to seal up the book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. And I think that tells us a lot about the approaches. So let me think about it. Uh, Revelation 11 to 13. Uh, who hasn't had a chance to read? Mm -hmm. I'd say that was me, Charlie. <laughs> okay. Who is unjust? Let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is a holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I can't, I'm coming quickly. And my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the last, first and the last. Amen. 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 You know, you notice this is very interesting that who's talking, who's saying these words? Jesus. Jesus saying these words, right? And and you see that he has now. It's determined who is going to be unjust and who are the unjust. That means the judgment is over. Yeah. Yeah. The, the unjust are those people who didn't accept the free gift of salvation, right? <laughs> yeah, because we're all unjust without it. So 
there are those people who have refused every invitation and they're going to still be, they're going to continue to do that. Uh, they are filthy because they continue to do that. The righteous are those, of course, who have accepted the invitation and they are holy because of that. The, you can say that the, that some people talk, talk about it. Uh, probation is over. The judgment has been made. Uh, and we know that it's a righteous judgment. We know that it's going to be, it was done with time, care, and love. But once that is done, Jesus immediately says, I'm coming quickly and my reward is with me. And yeah, to, the, sheep, the sheep and the goats have been identified. The yeah, wheat yeah. and the tares have been identified. Uh, so there is this point where uh, there is no more um, opportunity, I guess. Well, I mean, yeah, it's, all the, everyone's made the decision. Uh, like I say, Jesus is the beginning and the end, so he's, he has done the full cycle, um, and we can trust him because not only is our creator, he's our recreator. He's the author and finisher. <laughs> Excuse me. And it's time, for, it's time for it to end, and so that's why he says he comes quickly. I, I notice in Revelation 1.8, it also talks about being the Alpha and Omega who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. The Almighty. So uh, this idea about the beginning, the beginning and the end uh, tells us we have sh complete trust in everything he does. But uh, I, uh, I look forward to this day when, when we see him coming. Uh, I don't look forward to those people who have refused salvation. Uh, that, that breaks my heart. If it breaks my heart, I know that it doubly breaks Jesus' heart because he's reached out to everyone for that. Uh, Eddie, have you read this one? I will. Blessed are those who do the, his commandments <clears throat> that they might have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. But outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexual immoral and murderers and idolaters and who is, whoever loves and practices a lie. Yeah. There is there is a little bit of debate over whether it's blessed are those who do his commandments or blessed are those who wash their robes. And uh, down at the bottom here, you can see that I put in uh, both the translations and the Greek, uh, I guess the, in the, yeah, the English words of the Greek. You see, they're very similar uh, as far as the Greek would go for those two two translations. I think the Revised Standard Version says wash their, wash their robes, whereas the King James and New King James just do his commandments. Uh, I know that uh, when I looked out at uh, Uriah Smith's uh, understanding of that, he talked about very early translations of the Greek, and they were, blessed are they who do his commandments. And it seems to go along with uh, what we've seen, the overcomers, right? Overcomers have the right to the tree of life. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to go with uh, you know, they who do his commandments. It's probably the best translation here. Uh, yeah. Uh, in fact, if you did contextually here, I was, as it, or I'm sorry, Revelation also some in other places talk about those who do these commandments. Right. So That's true. wash the robes, I think, is kind of the only time that phrase would show up in uh, Revelation. But the, we have this do the commandments. We have the tree of life showing up. And we get the uh, he who overcomes eats the, from the tree of life. And so that sort of is contextually with that. May enter the gates, which means we can have the right to enter the city. Uh, we have in our hot little hands a ticket. And that ticket is for in the New Jerusalem. And that ticket is a ticket of faith. Because the ticket is something we have in our hands right now that we not might be able not be able to see. We can't see the place, but by faith we know we have it. So, but outside of the gates are dogs now i was i was a uh, that's probably the first time i've seen the dogs reference i'm not sure um but i don't think these are i don't think they're nice fluffy dogs uh, they're not fluffy. Or, 
<laughs> yeah, they're not little puppies. They're not little sniper. But they are you know, sorcerers. They're sexually immoral. They're murderers, idolaters. They practice. Uh, they love and practice a lie. Larry, you pointed out this to me yesterday. Who loves to practice? You know, who in the bigger sense loves lies? Politicians. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, I was thinking in terms of the author of lies, the uh, yes. Satan. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Satan is Satan is the author of lies. I mean, he he began gave the first lie, right? Uh, and and you so you see that these people, the description here, we have people who uh, who are hanging on to sin. Uh, and like Revelation 21, verse 8, they, he, they called it cowardly, unbelieving, abdominal, abominable, uh, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and, li and all liars. Uh, the, the sorcerers and idolaters sort of seem to come up, too, uh, uh, over and over again. So that's, to me, I look at these, these are all where people turn to other sources but God for strength. <laughs> And try to lead others into it too. So, all right, here we go. Jesus' final invitation. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star, and the spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him who hears say, Come, and let him who thirsts. Come, whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. Uh, we saw that wonderful river coming from the throne of God, and Jesus is giving us the invitation here to come drink from that river. Uh, just come. Uh, Jesus gave that invitation personally when he was here. He engraved it on his own flesh, but he said, come to me and enter my rest. Uh, all the promises to David, uh, the covenant with Abraham are all fulfilled in Jesus. The Holy Spirit has moved upon hearts and is moving upon the hearts offering with the water freely given to those who thirst for it. Uh, this, is a, this is the final calling in, in the Bible, the final calling in the book of Revelation. Uh, so the, uh, the beautiful city uh, is the bride and uh, and Jesus the spirit they all call uh, call us to take our place in the new Jerusalem and on the other side we're told not to mess with the book uh, uh, would someone like to read the don't mess with the book uh, 18 to 19 here <laughs> I'll read it. Okay. For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. Right. Okay, go ahead. So you can't add or delete. Yeah, <laughs> no adding or deleting, no changing the meaning, no making it so it's sealed when it's not sealed. Uh, uh, it's a warning that we need to all take care of. And you wonder who would dare to change God's prophecy. And to me, uh, go ahead. <laughs> the papacy maybe? Yeah, well, it's the same power we saw in Daniel. It was uh, he shall speak pompous words against the Most High? He shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and he shall in, intend to change times and laws. He would tend to he would he would not mind changing the words of this prophecy. And if we look in history, we see that the author, the guy who gave the I should say the guy who gave the uh, command, if you will, to his people. Uh, his priest to come up with alternatives was in fact the papacy to get the preterist and futurist interpretation of revelation. And why? Because 
if people rightly understood Revelation, they rightly understood what the papacy was, and he needed to obscure that. So, yeah. uh, so in doing that, he has violated, I think, this warning. This warning, and if we, and if any one of us does that, we are violating the warning if we try to change the meaning of of Revelation. And the consequences very extreme, very serious. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, we saw how bad the plagues were, the seven last plagues. Yeah. But the, the worst of what is when you're taken, taken out of the book of life, because then you have, you can't enter the holy city, you can't have the rights of the tree of life. Uh, yeah. Separation. Uh, and, and, and we know that those who would do that are actually interfering with the this, this salvation that God is trying to bring to the world. Yeah. yeah. And that's why I think it's so serious. So in 20 through 21, these are the final verses of, uh, of the book of Revelation. He who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. And Jesus assures us here that he is coming. When all things have happened, he will not tarry. He will come quickly. Uh, I think it's John saying, amen. He's agreeing with, <laughs> agreeing with God and saying how much he wants this all to come. For the return of Jesus Christ and the end of the suffering that sin brings all humanity. But until then... We know that his grace is sufficient for all of us. Amen. Any comments on that? Excellent. I look forward to that. Day. I just think coming quickly is is his version and our version of quickly is two different things. I think. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, I like I said, I I, I think there's those. There, yeah, you can you can argue that God's time is a uh, you know is is obviously different. If you've got eternity to play with, then what's a thousand years or so, right? Well, but, that's the thing, but that's what's hard for some people, even that have grown up in the church. They've been. But, the, saying, but like I say, the, the, this, what I came to the conclusion in here, when I hear what Jesus is saying, he's saying, hey, I have these events. I have these judgments. I have to make these determinations. I have lay them out for you so you understand what I'm doing and what is happening. And when those are all done, then I'll come. I'm coming quickly. Yeah. Right? yeah. I'm coming quickly. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to say, yeah, I'll let you go on for a few th more thousand years suffering. You know, those yes, things. I don't with... believe that either, but sometimes it's hard to convince other people. Yeah, I understand. I understand. Did, I understand. Didn't Jesus say something like this? Didn't he say, when you see these things come to pass, lift up your head for your redemption draws near or not. Right. Right. So uh, there is something about this coming quickly that's in the context of seeing the end time events. You know, in my, my humble opinion, sometimes I think the book of Revelation were, was written specifically for this generation. You know, because we're seeing, as we saw in these prophecies, we've seen almost all of them completed. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> what we're looking for next is for religious persecution with the uh, the papacy in the United States joining the uh, forces to force uh, worship. So, you know, that could happen. We saw what happened with COVID, how things changed so quickly. So why couldn't something else happen that would uh, push this prophecy along quick, quickly? Yeah. I, well, yeah, we know that things can happen quickly. We, we've always, most of us thought, oh, it'll take time until COVID happened. And we go, whoa. <laughs> yeah. That's what really changed change my quickly. mind brought me back. It really is. COVID, uh, I'd never seen anything like it. The yeah. whole world had never seen anything like it. So All right. I, believe, All right. yeah, I believe it's near the end of time. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, Eddie, you say it's for this generation. It is because we're so close to the end time. But I, I, I think if every generation could see where it was going, but they all had to see the plan. You know, what Jesus had in mind, the fact that he has the whole plan worked out, how we're going to get to the new Jerusalem 
and be with him. I think every Christian has needed to understand this. But yeah, for us, it seems to be more meaningful because we have all the history to go back and back it up. Our confidence in the book of Revelation should be really high, right? Mm -hmm. Leading us to have great faith in what's about to come. Well, you so know, why... think about all the, all the prophecies. There you go. We're at the 10 toes of uh, Daniel 2. We're uh, at, at the little horn power that received the heel, the wound, deadly wound and was healed. I mean, we're at the very bottom of all these charts you, that you just pulled up here. I can see yeah. that. Yeah. I wish everybody did. Yeah. You know, I, I talked to people. I just met a lady at the pool who said, hey, I don't even know what church she goes to. But she said, I think we're living in the last days. You know, she just pops out with that. Uh, and I'm going, I, I can't disagree with you for sure. <laughs> you know, and, uh, and God has a plan for us. So right. we, we have had a great study in, the, in Revelation uh, and Daniel. So I, I, I decided well, to put it all in one chart. <laughs> that's great. Oh I really appreciate uh, all the work you guys have gone to to do this. Uh, so is Eddie saying we had the, the image? Uh, this is a series of earthly kingdoms that ends up being crushed and replaced by the heavenly kingdom built upon Jesus Christ. Uh, we got to see a lot of more detail with the animals. We got to see who the kingdoms were and what were going to take place. We got to see the rise of the little horn power. And uh, and that seems to that goes through a long place because we see the little horn power. I have this little fold out here, which is the twenty three hundred days, which goes to somewhere here in the <laughs> in the sevens, right? It's a uh, it's the little horn power's power for twenty three hundred days. Mm -hmm. Up here, we saw in Daniel nine how we it predicts the coming of Jesus, the role of the Messiah, his crucifixion. And uh, and finally, the gospel being spread. So we saw all that in Daniel. Uh, we see the lamb was slain, uh, which was part of the seven. Uh, we see Jesus return. We see a Messiah, M M Michael standing up, Jesus returning. Uh, we saw all the gospel era. We saw all the plagues, the crushing of the little horn power, if you will. Uh, Jesus returning, the first resurrection, the thousand years, the second generation, the judgment, all the things thrown in the lake of fire, including death and Hades, uh, the devil is no more, and the beautiful new Jerusalem, the river of life, and the invitation for us to come. So here is, yeah, this is my attempt to summarize uh, 10 months or something of a study, but uh, in one chart. But, Good. Uh, but uh, I am so happy to have had this time with you guys. I don't know. I'd, would anyone like to offer a little a little testimony about about anything that's occurred to them during these studies? I just believe that the Revelation and Daniel are both very hard to to understand just by a normal human being such as myself. <laughs> And I really appreciate the time that y'all have gone to because there's so many symbols and everything. You know, everything is symbolized in Revelation. So unless you have somebody leading you, it's very hard to understand all of that, put it all together. So I really appreciate the work. I've been very well, thank blessed. You. I do thank you, too. Barbara. Barbara. Yeah, when, um, when Eddie and Larry and I decided to take this on, we were we knew that it was going to be big, but we also knew what a blessing it was going to be to do it. So, uh, what you guys don't know is that you know, I maybe mean, you probably know Eddie and 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 uh, Larry and I usually meet before we have a meeting and go over this stuff, and and we have a, a an amazing time as we as we as we get to pick each other's brains and spiritual experience and understanding before we give you the final, the final draft of what we we're talking about. It's been a great blessing to us too. I know that one thing I've had to uh, really fight to get this time. It seems like that, whether it's, seems there's like something pulling me away for something else every time I've gone to sit down for the study. And so I look forward to when you do it again, to have, uh, carved out this time is don't touch it and uh, really get it more out of it than I even did this time. Amen. Amen. I, I have oh. to say that the same uh, joy that 
I, I got a lot out of it this time in the preparation, uh, my part of the preparation, but I know the next time will be amazing what we walk away with. Yes. Yeah. Well, we, we've known when we scratched the surface that there's, uh, there's more for us to understand. And, uh, and God, uh, God's great a way he'll, he'll let us peel away of the onion and find more information and understanding. Uh, I am, I, you've heard me say it many times, I am, I became, I'm still overwhelmed that uh, something I'd never seen before became so, so, so plain to me in this study, which was until Jesus was crucified and went back to heaven, there was no one worthy to carry out the plan of salvation. And, uh, you know, no one were worthy to open up the seals. And every in that whole universe, there was no one was worthy. And my wife asked me if there was, if there was a plan B. You know, was there anyone else who could have done it if Jesus failed? I'm going, doesn't look like it. <laughs> Looks like it was all on Jesus. And uh, failure he carried was not through. an option. Yeah. Mm. Well, uh, Charlie, you... uh, I got a question. Sure. Can you see me on the screen? I can see you on the on my little screen. I can see you, yes. Uh, my screen is gone. Complete, my screen is gone completely blank. Oh. That we still see you. Charlie's oh. gone, but we see you. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm not going to be able to end the recording or end the meeting. I'll have to turn my computer off. But I don't know why that happened. <laughs> okay. Well, right now we're still recording, so that's good. Um. Uh, one thing I wanted to talk about is what's next. We talked about that earlier. Trying to sounds like you sounds like Barbara and Joy would like to sit with us through the Daniel Revelation again, which I think I would love it. I would love it because you'd be our experts. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. And uh, in fact, maybe we could give them a little responsive. I don't know, but but and also it sounds like you're both in in for uh, John, First John, Second John, so forth, or John. And uh, when we come up with the time, we'll get back together with you on that. But okay. I'm looking forward yeah, to it because one First thing John is one of my most is one of my most favorite books. So go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say it's going to be the next time we do Daniel Revelation. We're working on some advertisement uh, to make this um, to adver advertise uh, big time. So we may have a larger crowd. I'm praying that we will. Uh, the, the best way, though, to get uh, uh, folks to join is for you guys to invite. Uh, word of mouth does uh, more than any kind of advertising can do. Because yeah. when you think about it, people don't know who we are. And yeah, um, true. So uh, I think the way it's really going to work well is for you to advertise it uh, in your churches, uh, with your friends. <clears throat> and I think I hope you guys have seen that we tried to make this very non-denominational. Uh, tried to respect uh, each person's views, and uh, so um, anyway, I just wanted to say that that part. That, uh, I think we're going to plan on taking a couple of weeks off, then we'll start up the first John, and we'll make sure that we uh, communicate with you folks. Oh, and I'm back. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah so uh, we will if y'all are okay with that we'll take just a couple of weeks off and we'll let you know when we're going to start up first john yeah yeah and we'll, we'll, we'll advertise that in the churches too i you know I, we, we're always telling them at, at madison campus you, i don't guys see it but it's always in their newsletter about what we've done their links yeah. Yeah, so we'll, we'll we'll put it in there for sure and i'll try to get the other churches in the nashville area get them all information that I can that I can so, in, fact, I, in fact I'll put it on my uh, my community page <laughs> and, uh, well, you know and I'm, I'm between churches right now because I've moved to Pikeville Tennessee and uh, there's several churches around here I, I don't know where we'll wind up we'll let the Lord lead on that but um, just in this community right here that I'm at I know that there's uh, five five churches um, and, and we're way out in the country too, I'll tell you. So anyway, I, I love you guys. I've enjoyed this, uh, seeing your faces and hearing your comments and Larry and Charlie, especially as we've worked together 
to produce these. It's been a real blessing to me. Amen. Amen. Andy, uh, yeah, I, I want to uh, want to tell Barbara once again. I thank you so much for all your support. And Joy, I know that you've had a lot of different things in your life going on, including being the sole breadwinner for a while during Christmas. So, but you but you hung in there for us, and I really really appreciate that. And uh, and I will appreciate Shirley. I know she's going. She would be here if she wasn't feeling bad right now. So uh, we uh, definitely there. And Sally, uh, Sally's not here tonight, but uh, she's been pretty faithful. Uh, so I, I just, uh, just, just looking forward to the next round. Maybe we'll get everyone back and say, we're going to do it even bigger and better. Yeah. Yeah. God bless you. All right. Well, good Thank night, everyone. You. Take Bye -bye. care. And we'll see you in a few weeks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.